and found, we read from the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, beginning with verse 11. Let us hear these holy words. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate, so he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set out for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's all have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, You are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad. Because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the word of God for the people of God. again say a word of welcome this morning to all of you. We're certainly glad you're here as we gather together to celebrate our faith. It is a joy to have you in our presence. If you're visiting with us, again, we say a special word of welcome. I have a special friend here today that I don't want to embarrass. And usually when you're a Methodist preacher and you go to another church, you want to be incognito because you don't want any responsibility other than be able to just worship. But Dr. Andy Stoker, the senior pastor of First United Methodist Church in Dallas, Texas, is with us today. Andy, we're grateful for your presence. You want to wave? Let everybody see where you are. So, everybody speak to Andy so when he goes back to Big D and he's on television, he can tell everybody how uh, friendly this church is. We're certainly thankful for all of you here today. If you are visiting, please know we're grateful. We're grateful that you're here. We continue our series of sermons, Lost and Found. Today, we look at the older brother and his reaction to his younger brother's return home. Let's bow our heads. Oh, Lord, in the silence of this moment, prepare our hearts and our minds to hear your word for us this day and work your will in our lives. Amen. I am not a particularly good golfer, but a number of years ago, everything lined up perfectly for me. We were having a church golf tournament. There were about 80 participants in my congregation. It was on a Saturday. The wind was just perfect. Clouds in the sky, but you could see the blue. Everything lined up perfectly. During the course of the day, we were divided into four teams of four. 
But there were also a couple of competitions during the course of the day in which each one of us could participate. Longest drive and closest to the hole. And on this day, I want to tell you, I won longest drive and closest to the hole. It is one of my fondest memories in life. <laughs> 80 participants, I won both events. Now, I had seen all the door prizes that were in place prior to the event. So I knew, I just knew there were going to be great gifts in store for me having won both of those competitions. Now, our team didn't fare very well, but I didn't care. I had won longest drive and <laughs> closest to the hole. So when the golf tournament was over that day, we went in to have a nice meal. Now, it was time for the MC to call me forward. Longest drive winner, John Robbins, please come forward. After an extraordinarily long standing ovation, I came forward. They gave me three golf balls. <laughs> I wanted to say, this is a joke, right? I won a competition. I'm looking at golf bags and gold-plated putters and all these other gifts that are door prizes. I get three golf balls. They said, John, just stand up here because, ladies and gentlemen, once again, we want you to know the winner of closest to the hole is John Robbins. John, here's your gift. Three more golf balls. <laughs> Six golf balls for winning two competitions. I went and sat down, and then they started drawing names, winners of particular events. That is, people who had a chance to go forward and claim their prize simply for showing up. They were the door prizes. 77 of the 80 people received a door prize. I did not. There were custom golf bags and gold putters and uh, gift certificates to expensive restaurants and all of these kinds of things. And I started thinking to myself, wait a minute. These people just show up and they get a really expensive golf bag. I win two competitions and I get six golf balls. That's not fair. And lo and behold, I stewed over that for some time. Because here we are. Some people just showed up. Something really special happened. I felt like I had earned something and got virtually nothing. Jesus tells us a parable about two brothers. The younger one, as was discussed last week, disrespects his father, wanders off, comes back, and a party is thrown for him. Well, that doesn't seem fair, does it? Certainly not to the older brother, who's been faithful and loyal to his father, and he gets nothing. The younger brother just shows up. You go to work, you have someone who works close to you, they come in late almost every day, they take an extra long lunch regularly, time and again they leave early, and they get the promotion? Well, that's not fair. That's not right. That's not the way it's supposed to be, is it? As we look at this story, we can empathize and sympathize with the older brother. But honestly, if we look closely, we discover that the older brother, though he never left home, in some ways is just as lost as the younger brother who squandered everything and returned. When the older brother finds out that there's a party going on for the younger brother who wasted all that he was given, the older brother becomes very angry. So his father comes out to him, father, head of the house, the one in charge, the decision maker. And the older brother shows him an extraordinary lack of respect. He calls into question his father's decision. And in that culture and that day and time, that was prohibited. 
It's a sign of a lack of regard for one in a position of authority. The older brother says, not to his father, Father, why would you make a decision like that? But instead he says, look, I've been faithful all along, and you throw him a party? He's wasted all of this money on all kinds of things? He shows a total lack of regard and respect for the father's authority and for his father in general. He feels like he's owed something. And we can relate to that. He's been faithful. He's been committed. He's done what he's supposed to do. And he doesn't get anything. And the younger brother just shows up again. And he has a party. But notice what the father does. He says to the older brother, still showing him proper respect, son, everything I have is yours. It's already here. But your brother was lost and he's been found. What else could we do but have a party? See, the older brother is much like us. When we're faithful and committed and we do what we're supposed to do, sometimes we resent people who have done everything they shouldn't do and seem to be rewarded in some special way when they come back. Well, that's not fair. Here we have a situation where the older brother becomes very self-righteous and judgmental. And he believes that he's the one who can now make a determination about who's worthy and who's deserving of grace and forgiveness and mercy. And obviously he believes his younger brother is not entitled to that. And if we're not careful, we can fall into that category of becoming very self-righteous and judgmental about who's deserving and who's not. We watch on the news, someone commits some kind of heinous crime, and then the one who has suffered greatly says, well, I forgive that person. You can't forgive that person. They've inflicted pain and suffering. They need to suffer. What do you mean, forgive them? Sometimes deep within us, we really don't want some people to receive that grace and that mercy and that forgiveness. We're like the older brother. We say, wait a minute, that's not fair. I've been faithful all along. I've tried to do what I'm supposed to do. I've tried to do good, make a difference. And someone sneaks in under the wire at the 11th hour and they get the same thing. That's not fair. Jesus told several parables that can be very irritating about grace and mercy and forgiveness extended to people whom sometimes we believe aren't deserving but the truth is we recognize that none of us are deserving and we get it anyway we just want to make a determination about who is entitled to it and who's not sometimes like the older brother we can be just as lost as the one who wanders away Jesus tells a parable about a Pharisee and a tax collector who go before God in prayer. Now, Pharisees are disciplined. They fast and they tithe. They try to do good. Tax collectors are conniving and manipulative. They're turncoats and they're traitors. They take advantage of other people. And when the prayer is done, Jesus says it is this conniving, manipulative person who has asked to be forgiven, who empties himself before God, who receives that which enables him to be justified before our Lord. Well, that's not fair. He's been so incredibly manipulative for so long. He's taken advantage of all sorts of people, and he gets this grace and this mercy and this forgiveness, shouldn't he have to pay for it in some way? Shouldn't he have to suffer for a while and then we'll reconvene and make a determination about whether or not he's worthy? Jesus tells us about a man who owns a field. He needs people to work. So early in the morning, he brings some in and he says, I'll pay you a fair day's wage if you will work for me all day long. They agree. They go out and begin to work. There's some who show up about 10 o'clock in the morning. He gives them work, some about noon, some well into the afternoon, and some just before quitting time shows up. And he lets them work for just a matter of minutes, it seems. And then, lo and behold, it's time for everybody to be paid. And the ones who have worked only a matter of minutes get the same thing as those who have worked all day long. That's not fair. 
And those who have worked all day long go before the one who owns the field, and they complain. And in essence, he says this, it's not your call. I told you I would give you a fair day's wage. I have. You got what was coming to you. But that's not fair. You gave the same thing to someone who was here just a matter of minutes. And the one who owns the field says, I can do what I want. I own the field. The father says to the older son, who's put out that the younger son gets a party, the father says, listen, everything I have is already yours anyway. Enjoy it. And the older son, in some way, who's simply done what he's supposed to do, feels like he has been cheated. And someone who's undeserving gets special treatment. Well, isn't that what grace is all about? Those of us who are undeserving get God's special treatment. God still acknowledges us. God still claims us as his very own. God still gives us a second chance, another opportunity. Isn't that what grace is all about? I like grace. I love grace. I'm dependent on grace. I just want all of it, and I'm not so sure you're deserving of it sometimes. That's where I'm like the older brother. And when we become that self-righteous and that judgmental, we become full of darkness. And we empty ourselves of any compassion and love for others. You know what's not fair? I tell you what's not fair. Is that this man who walks the face of the earth without sin took upon himself all of the sin of all of humanity and died to that sin in a horrific way. That's not fair. You know this man who offered grace and mercy and forgiveness, who included the excluded and the marginalized and the broken, was denied, betrayed, and abandoned by his closest companions. That's not fair. And yet that very man has the capacity to offer grace and mercy and forgiveness to whomever he chooses. And thank God he chooses you and he chooses me. And it's always fair when it's placed on me. But sometimes we look around at other people and we say, well, that's not fair. They just showed up. And they get something that nice? We have to be careful because if we are not careful, we begin the process of believing that somehow we are superior to other people because we've simply done what we were supposed to do. And that is be faithful. And if we are not careful, we begin the process of believing that when we do just what we are supposed to do, somehow God owes us as a result. The older brother believed that he was owed something for just doing what he was supposed to be doing. We do that a lot with God. I've been faithful. God, you owe me now. And that's preached from a lot of pulpits, this prosperity gospel. I've been faithful. That means I'm not going to get cancer. That means I'm going to have money. That means everybody around me, as long as they are faithful, will be blessed too because God owes me that because I've been faithful. There is that God's favor gospel where you name it and claim it and God must give it because God owes it to you. So next time you're in a parking lot and there's not a parking spot anywhere in Houston, Texas, you just name it and claim it. And you know what? There should be a parking spot for you that just emerges. Now, if there's not, you don't have enough faith. Too bad, so sad. But those of us who deserve it and are entitled to it, lo and behold, that big old truck just backed out and it's just time for me to pull right in. That is preached even in Houston, Texas from pulpits. Just name it and claim it. God owes it to you because you've been faithful. That flies in the very face of the gospel that says this, from the mouth of the one who dispenses grace. I didn't come to be served, but to serve. And oh, by the way, it's the last who will be first. And if you want to win your life, you have to lose it. How do you reconcile the two? You cannot. The older brother is like us sometimes. We really, if we are honest, resent 
when some people get what we think they don't deserve. And we should always get it because we always deserve it. My brother Tom is a United Methodist pastor. A number of years ago when he was serving in a different church from the church he serves now, he preached a sermon about forgiveness, and in the course of the sermon, he said, we're all the people who need to be forgiven. All of us are sinners. He walked to the back of the service to greet people at the end of that worship experience, and a woman came up to him and said, I'm deeply offended by your sermon. He said, why? She said, you said in your sermon, we're all sinners and all in need of God's forgiveness. He said, yes. She said, I don't sin. I don't need to be forgiven. He said, I beg your pardon? She said, the next time you preach that sermon, you say we're all sinners, but then you call me by name and tell them I'm the exception. <laughs> he said, you do realize that 1 John says that if you say you're without sin, you are a liar and the truth is not in you. And she said, I don't care what the Bible says. You distinguish me from everybody else. Now, that's an extreme, but listen, sometimes we get close to that. They're not deserving. They're not like me. They're not entitled to that. I've been faithful. Who are they? Look at all the wrong they've done. And God says, I owe the field. I'm the one who owns it. I can dictate what I dispense and who I give it to. The father says, I have two sons, and sometimes we're like the youngest son. We wander off, we make monumental mistakes, we come back groveling, wishing to be forgiven. And lo and behold, our Heavenly Father runs to us, embraces us, and says to us, we're going to have a party. You are lost and you have been found, and we celebrate that. But sometimes we're like the older brother as well who is just as lost though he has not left home because he shows a tremendous lack of respect for the decision-making power of his father. And then he resents that someone he thinks is undeserving gets what he thinks he deserves. The challenge in the Christian faith is to recognize that sometimes we're the younger son and sometimes we are the older son. But the good news is they both and we both have the same father. The father who goes to the younger son running to him and embracing him and saying, we're so glad you're home, we're going to have a party. And a father who runs to the son who won't even come in, who wants nothing to do with any of that, who still goes to that son as well and invites him to come. We're continually invited by the father, whether we're the younger or the older. So we need to remember when we feel this sense of entitlement that somehow God owes us because we've been faithful, we've done good, we need to remember that every single one of us are solely dependent on the grace of God and God's mercy and God's forgiveness. Because every one of us, whether we want to believe it or not, are a people of sin who either look down on people as inferior to us or we have wandered away and we're just trying to show up again. You see, when I went to that golf tournament and then I complained afterwards to the guy who put the event on and said, why is it that people who just showed up get golf bags and gold-plated putters and by golly, I worked hard and I earned something and I get six golf balls. And he says to me, hey, preacher, it ain't your call. I put on the golf tournament, I decide who gets what, and you get six golf balls. <laughs> yes, sir. So we remember that what's great about this parable that Jesus offers is that it's for all of us. Because we can be the older or the younger, 
because we are the older sometimes and we are the younger sometimes. But the good news is no matter what, we have the same father who runs to us, says, my son, my daughter, we're going to have a party and we want everybody to come because everything I have is already yours anyway. So whether you think you've been faithful for a long time and you resent people who sneak in under the wire, or whether you've been one who's wandered off, please know that I offer you the same thing. It is grace. It is mercy. It is forgiveness. Thank God that's the kind of heavenly father we have, even when we feel like we deserve more and others deserve less. He decides because he owns the field. And thank God he's the owner and we are not. Hallelujah.